April 13th, 2010. Southeast side of Hong Kong. Local time is 1.19 in the afternoon. The pilots smelled it before they saw it. A sharp pop, then ozone, and then deep burning. Seconds later, both engines failed midair. The cockpit lit up with alarm sounds. Engine one control system fault, engine two stall. A routine flight to Hong Kong was now a fight to survive at 35,000 feet. This is the breathtaking story of the Cathay Pacific Flight 780 disaster and what happened next. Just one day ago, April 12th, Surabaya, East Java, a Cathay Pacific Airbus A330 had just been refueled at Stand 6 in Surabaya. During the previous flight, the pilots noticed something odd with Engine 1. So after landing, they reported the strange behavior. Ground maintenance checked it and replaced something called the fuel metering unit, a part that controls how much fuel the engine gets, like turning a tap on a sink. And the engine seemed fine after that. The next day, April 13th, a new crew came in. Two experienced pilots and 11 cabin crew members prepared for the return flight from Surabaya to Hong Kong at 8.20 in the morning. The captain had flown for over 7,700 hours, with 2,600 of those in this same type of plane. The first officer had over 4,000 flight hours, and he had even flown in the Royal Australian Air Force before joining Cathay Pacific. They checked the logbook, and it showed nothing wrong. The aircraft, now 12 years old, had two strong Rolls-Royce Trent 700 engines. When they checked the weather reports, it mentioned thunderstorms and crosswinds, but nothing serious. At Stand 8, when the plane was being refueled, the captain went to check the fuel sample, and it looked perfectly fine. He only noticed one trivial problem. The fuel hose was shaking. He thought it was just air trapped in the underground pipes, like when a kitchen tap sputters and bubbles after sitting unused. To fix it, he stopped fueling for a moment, let the pressure settle, then started again, and followed this process back and forth for several times. Turns out the pressure across the filter had also gone up a little. But it was a minor fault, and he only made a note of it in the logbook and moved on, because everything still looked normal. So finally, at 8.24 in the morning, aircraft took off. During the climb, engine 2's pressure ratio, basically its heartbeat, suddenly began fluctuating. The number hovered around 0.015. Meanwhile, engine 1 fluctuated too, but slightly. The surprising part was that there were no alarms. The engine sounded healthy, steady. But the pilots had already made a mental note that they'd tell engineers about this once they land. But God knew that this conversation would never happen because of what happened next. About 33 minutes into the flight, cruising high above the clouds at 39,000 feet, a bright message lit up the electronic centralized aircraft monitor. It read, engine two control system fault, engine two slow response. This was a sign of danger, but there were no checklists to follow, no clear steps to take. So the captain got on the radio with Cathay Pacific's maintenance control. An engineer responded, try moving the thrust lever, see if the engine reacts. It did but not properly. The crew also considered switching from EPR engine pressure ratio to N1, which is a different way to measure engine power based on fan speed. The thrust responded and they stayed the course. Back at headquarters, engineers monitored the aircraft's heartbeat in real time and all seemed manageable, but it was a temporary fix because neither the pilots nor the engineers knew what was really happening. An hour and 15 minutes after that first warning, air traffic control asked the pilots to descend slightly to 38,000 feet. Once they did this, the same warning blinked back to life. Engine two control system fault. But now it came with more words. Avoid rapid thrust changes. And again, engine two slow response. The pilots toggled the anti-ice system just to see. The engine still reacted, but that eerie silent signal in the instruments refused to disappear. Because underneath it all, the real reason was progressing, which we will reveal later. And now engine one was also under attack. This time the captain made another call to maintenance control. So they guessed it might be compensation, which means when one engine adjusts slightly when the other changes. But in reality, each engine works independently, so this wasn't normal. Still, the engineer gave advice, move the throttle slowly, avoid sudden surges in power, and above all, land in Hong Kong as planned. And they also said that the fuel metering unit would be replaced once they arrived. So the pilots pressed on. But little did they realize that the next time they'd need thrust, it would be a test of survival. It was just after 1.19 in the afternoon. Flight Cathay 780 had already crossed into Hong Kong airspace, 
and working on the usual preparation for landing. But suddenly, two warning messages lit up the cockpit like flares in the dark. Engine 1 control system fault. Engine 2 stall. So now both engines were compromised. At this point, the captain reduced power on engine 2 to idle, trying to stabilize it. That left only engine 1 to keep the aircraft flying. But engine 1 wasn't behaving either. The screen flashed a new warning. Engine 1 slow response and avoid rapid thrust changes. It was like trying to ride a bike up a steep hill, but the pedals only worked if you pushed them just right. And even then, they worked occasionally. So desperate to hold altitude, the captain pushed engine 1 to max continuous power, the highest setting allowed in this kind of emergency. As a result, the engine surged, but then started dropping from about 57% thrust to 37, which is practically becoming idle. Finally, the captain picked up the mic. Pan, 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 pan. This is Cathay 780. We're operating engine 2 at idle thrust. Request elevated response. The tower acknowledged. Emergency crews on the ground were told to stand by. Inside the cockpit, the captain now had no choice but to plan a landing on just one unstable engine. At 1.30, with just 45 miles left, things started to go even more wrong. The captain gently pushed the first engine, hoping to get a bit more power. Instead, the cockpit came up with a new warning. Engine 1 is failing, so they had to pull the power on that engine all the way back to idle. The pilots tried to increase power again, but the engine stalled completely. They were still 8,000 feet above the sea, still traveling at nearly 300 knots. No doubt they weren't going to make it. The captain declared a mayday. They were quickly told to start descending to 3,000 feet. The captain turned off the autopilot and took control by hand. He kept the nose slightly up and slowed the plane to 200 knots. That's the safest speed when power is limited. Meanwhile, the first officer quickly turned on backup systems. He started the APU, a small backup engine, and switched on something called continuous ignition, which helps restart engines. Then through the clouds, they finally saw the airport, which gave them hope. Suddenly, engine one also came back to life, and it only gave about 74% of power better than nothing. But engine two was still dead, stuck at just 17%, completely useless. The plane could still fly, but no one knew what would happen once it touched the ground. The control tower cleared them to land on either runway. They chose the one on the left. Meanwhile, new warning messages kept showing up. The first officer pulled out a checklist for a rare and scary situation, both engines shutting down even though there was still fuel. They thought maybe they could still restart engine two, but it was a long shot. He deployed the emergency air turbine, a small wind-powered fan that gives backup electricity. He used air from the APU and tried restarting engine two, but it didn't work. Meanwhile, there was no time left. The captain prepared to land. At 1.42, he called for flaps to be set at position one. The plane was still 5,600 feet above ground and flying fast at 219 knots, and they were still nine miles away, too high, too fast. But the captain wanted altitude in case engine one quit again. So he pulled the throttle back, and it stayed stuck at 74%. To buy some time, the captain made the plane take a longer turn, swinging it wide before lining it up with the runway from the north. But as they got closer to the runway, there was a problem. They were still way too high in the sky, about 5,000 feet up, even though they were just eight miles away. They were also flying too fast, over 230 knots. The captain pulled the speed brakes to slow the plane down and lowered the landing gear. The nose of the plane tilted forward, diving slightly. A loud warning alarm went off inside the cockpit. The ground was coming up fast, and the warning system shouted, Too low terrain! Pull up! With just a few seconds left, the captain reached for the final lever. And what happened next would become a legendary moment in the story of Cathay 780. The plane slammed into the runway, too fast, too hard, too late, at over 230 knots. That's almost double the normal landing speed. It touched down 680 meters into the runway, farther than it should have. The right wheel hit first, but bounced. The captain forced the nose down for a second landing, and this time, the left engine hit the runway. Sparks flew as metal scraped the ground. By this time, it should have caught fire already. The first officer looked at the control lights, and there was no sign the reverse engines had worked. Only one engine was helping to slow them. So the captain turned off the auto brakes and pressed the brakes by hand as hard as he could. The plane finally slowed and came to a stop, just 300 meters before the runway ended. But the danger wasn't over yet. The pilots looked at the brake temperatures. It was hotter than a pizza oven. Naturally, before it caught fire, the fire trucks rushed in and sprayed water on the wheels. Meanwhile, smoke was already curling up into the air. The captain told the passengers to stay in their seats while the crew followed the emergency checklist. He didn't want to rush into an evacuation because people often get hurt during those. Once everything came under control, the captain gave the order. Evacuate! Evacuate! The cabin crew jumped into action, doors opened, slides popped out and inflated, and passengers rushed out. But some didn't listen. They stopped to grab their bags. That slowed everything down. The evacuation took two minutes and 15 seconds in total, longer than the target of 90 seconds. In the end, 259 people got out safely. Amidst them, six
62 had small injuries, cuts, bruises, sprained ankles. One woman hurt her ankles so badly she needed surgery, but no one died. The last people to leave the plane were the captain, the first officer, and the lead cabin crew. After the fire was out, investigators searched for answers, and that's when they found something small but shocking. There was salt water was hiding inside the underground fuel pipes. When the fuel flowed through, the salt water entered the filter. This filter had something called SAP, superabsorbent polymer, that work like sponges to soak up water. But they were not made to handle salt waters, so the salt stuck to the SAP and stopped it from doing its job. And that way, the pressure inside the filter kept building until the filter started to bulge and crack. Small holes opened, and fuel began to sneak through, unfiltered and contaminated, into the plane's tanks. Normally, a damaged filter would not be a huge danger, but this time was different. The valves and joints inside the fuel metering unit got jammed. When the plane was flying steadily, the valves barely moved, so no problem happened. But if the thrust changed quickly, anything lethal could have happened, and this salt water came from the airport's fuel system. After this incident, the entire fuel supply at Wanda Airport was shut down, cleaned, and tested again. Indonesian airport officials were blamed for not keeping things in order. Airbus also updated its warning systems to better detect this kind of problem in the future. And in 2014, both pilots were given the Polaris Award, the highest honor for flying in an emergency. So do you think this flight should have diverted earlier, when the first engine showed faults? And should ground Ground engineers be held more accountable for missing critical signs during refueling? Share your thoughts in the comments. Like, subscribe, and share if this story made you rethink how close calls really happen. Want to explore other near crash landings, failures caused by human error, or how small oversights spiral into disasters?